Listen, we want to say happy Father's Day to everybody here, so why don't we give it up again, a round of applause for all the dads in the house, all the dads up in the house. Man, thank you all so much. Y'all are looking so good. You really are looking so good being here. And, uh, and I, I'll say this, I say it kind of every weekend, but every weekend it's true, and every weekend it, it, um, it hits me a little bit harder. Uh, if you're here for the very first time, I, you know, on behalf of myself, and my beautiful wife, come on, give it up for Mariah. She's looking so fine. She's still looking so fine. You know, there's very few times that she uh, sits by me, but, uh, but she is, um, you know, I think I put on a spritz of cologne this morning. Hey, hey, let's go, girl. No, but she's normally, uh, she's normally watching your kids and stuff like that and Revo kids, but uh, she was blessing me today because it's Father's Day, it's special day. It's not, not many days. I get in the doghouse, half of them, but today... Today is a good day. I might get a kiss afterwards, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, but excited about this because here's the thing, guys. If you're here for the very first time, if you've been coming here, you know the story. Uh, but I want to share it with you if you're here for the first time. You know, we, we launched this church, planted this church out of a dream. And uh, we planted it last year in 2020. Uh, we were eight weeks old as a church. Uh, and so you can imagine at eight weeks old, getting told on week nine that you cannot show up and do church any longer. And so that dream kind of was like, you know, just kind of, like it just kind of diminished. And, uh, and have you ever had those moments where you, where you think God is telling you something, you step out into it, and then it doesn't happen the way you think it's supposed to happen, and then you start to argue with God a little bit? God, I mean, come on, man. You know, well, that's how I felt. And so we were homeless for months, didn't have a church, but still had a dream in our heart, wanted to give up, uh, and we remembered the why. Why are we here? Uh, we're here to help restore hope and build futures. I, I know that there's a lot of people in this room, uh, including myself, where we have gone through seasons of life where things have sucked the life out of us, and we just need a little injection of hope. And God reminded me, hey, through COVID, through all of these things, listen, you are here to help restore hope and build futures. And what better opportunity it is during a worldwide pandemic to do that. And, uh, and, and so that is a little bit of our story, guys. And so I want to say this, that you're sitting in a miracle. You're sitting in a miracle. We should have closed these doors down, but God. Come on, but God. Why don't we give God some praise real quick? Every single week, it's a new week, it's a new day. Every single week, new people come. I shared this, I think, a couple of weeks ago. I see a day, and I believe a day is coming, where this room is completely full, and we are going to multiple services. We are reaching more people. We are seeing more people healed. We are seeing more people delivered. We are seeing more people restored. Come on, if you believe that, we are going to see God move in this church and throughout our city. Amen. Let's do this. Well, uh, I'm fired up, guys. If you don't know me, this, this is me. I mean, you, you, what you see is what you get, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm not the youth pastor, and the real pastor's not coming up on stage in a few minutes. So uh, this, is, this is what you got, what you got. So it's what you work with. I'm just a little Louisiana boy straight out the bayou. Ain't got a whole lot of sense, but I'm going to give it what I got, you know what I mean. Hey, well, we are in this collection of talks, uh, habits, habits, habits. Um, we started this, a little mini-series, last week. Uh, we started uh, Habits, and I believe, just like we read up on the, sco- uh, uh, on the screen, small things, big difference. I believe that there's things in our lives that we, we create through habits. We create through one thought, one step, one habit at a time. And so if you weren't here last week, here's a little recap of last week for you. Last week we talked about how do you start a good habit? How do you start a good habit? The three things that that we said was based on who you want to become, what do you need to start? And so we said, hey, in order to start a good habit, you needed to make it obvious. Come on, make it obvious. If I want to start reading a book, I need to put a book on my Pella every single morning. So when I get home at night, yeah, I said Pella. And so when I get home at night, uh, I see the book on my Pella and... uh, now I'm, I'm saying it in my head. I'm messing myself up. And so that's just how I talk. So, so I see it on my pillow, and, and I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to read it. You know, if I want to start reading the Bible, you know, so many times people say, man, I just want to learn to read the Bible. I want to start reading the Bible. I want to read the Bible. And so, so what we do is we say, I'm going to read the Bible in 90 days. But the reality is we ain't even cracked open a Bible in 90 years. You know what I mean? 
It's just like, don't make it so hard. Just, just make, make, it, make it obvious. Put it right there. Make it easy. you got to make it easy. If I want to read the Bible, start with you version and read a scripture of the day. Pop open you version on your phone, and there's a scripture right there in, the, in, your, in your phone, and you can read that scripture. You can chew on that scripture, just the scripture of the day. And then you can get to a paragraph, and then maybe a page, and then maybe a chapter. Make it easy. And the third thing we talked about was just keep showing up. Keep showing up. Here's the reality. The reality is, is that people that make New Year's resolutions and they try to start all of these different things, 92% of the people that try to start something never complete it. So the reality is, is we're going to fail. That's just the reality. So we have to keep showing up. Just keep showing up. And today what I want to talk about is, today we're going to talk about how to break bad habits. Last week we talked about how to create good habits. This week we're going to talk about how do we break bad habits. Because here's the reality. The reality is, is no one wakes up every single day wanting to live paycheck to paycheck. That's the reality. No, nobody wants to wake up living paycheck to paycheck, stressing over money, and when something is spent, man, I can't believe you did that. You spent all that money. I can't believe you spent money at Target. <clears throat> I can't believe you spent that money. Nobody wakes up stressing and wanting to stress over money, living paycheck to paycheck. Nobody wakes up saying that I just want to be overweight. I, 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 don't, I want to be in poor health. I want to die young. Nobody wakes up saying that I want to be addicted to drugs or I want to be an alcoholic. Nobody wakes up saying I just want to live this mediocre life with no passion, no drive. My vision is wasted and I have all these regrets. Or regrets, if you know what I'm talking about. Here's the thing. Rarely do we end up at the wrong place because of one bad choice. We end up in the wrong place because of habits. Wrong place, one step, one day at a time, one bad habit at a time. And here's the thing is as we get these bad habits... As we have these habits that begin to come over our lives, we, we begin to summarize them in a sentence. If, if you look at someone that has a bad habit, this is, this is how we summarize it up in one thing. Oh, well, you know, here, here's the thing. They, they, they battled this weight problem, and so they, they had a heart attack at a young age. We summarize it in a sentence. Oh, oh, you know what? They, they just don't follow the rules. They don't follow up with what they're supposed to do. And so because of that, they were fired from a job or they were let go from school. We summarize things in a sentence. We summarize people's habits based off of a sentence. You know, and I love this, I love this uh, scripture in Judges chapter 16. In Judges chapter 16, it says this. It says that one day, everybody say one day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. If you're not familiar with Samson, and maybe, maybe you're not familiar with him in the Bible, this is kind of all new to you, let me, let me paraphrase this. Let me kind of set the scene for you real quick. Samson was this guy who was born with this supernatural strength. Samson had this crazy strength, and, and nobody could defeat him. Samson would literally go out and kill thousands with a jawbone. Samson was this guy who, it doesn't matter how you tied him up, how you pinned him, how you did anything, he would always break free. But here was the catch. God made this promise to Samson and said, hey, you will always be strong as long as you don't cut your hair. So here's Samson, we're in Judges chapter 16, verse 1. It says, one day, everybody say one day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Now here's the thing about Gaza. Gaza was a place where Samson was public enemy number one. Gaza was this place, this town, where if Samson showed up, he had every uh, opportunity of being killed, Every opportunity of being thrown into prison, Samson, if he showed up in Gaza, what Samson would do is he was literally taking his life in his own hands. 
He was saying to himself, you know what? I'm just going to go to Gaza. I'm going to mind my own business. I'm going to do my thing. And Samson walked into this town where he literally could have died. And so Samson said one day, he went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Now, now Gaza from Samson's hometown was 25 miles. Now, how many of y'all know back in the day they ain't had Uber? <laughs> they ain't had Uber. They ain't had to yell a taxi. They didn't have a, a, a little electric bicycle. They didn't have a hoverboard. Come on, you know, just riding the hoverboard. Samson did, didn't ride this, just, just didn't just ride this hoverboard. He didn't, he didn't whistle, you know, like taxi. Back in the day, Samson, let's just assume he had to walk 25 miles. So Samson had this thought. One day, he walked to Gaza, 25 miles. Let me, let me help you understand how long this takes. That is 56,250 steps. 25 miles will take... 56,200 steps. How many of y'all know if he had an Apple Watch, that thing would have died, blowed up, and rolled over dead? I'm just telling you, Samson, one day, one day had this thought that I'm going to leave Zora, I'm going to leave my hometown, and I'm going to walk 56,250 steps to a place where I am public enemy number one. I have to put on some kind of outfit so people don't notice me. I have to put this thing on so people don't understand who I am. 56,250 steps. How many of you can honestly stay listening to this moment that was a probably the stupidest risk that he could probably take? Would you, would you agree to that? Samson. Public enemy number one, going to a town where he could be killed or he could be in prison. 56,250 steps. He could have gone to this town. And, and, and we can look at this story, we can read this story, we can unpack this story and realize, bro, you are the stupidest person I have ever seen. Wave at me if you believe that's true. Okay, some of you don't. Okay, anyway. Here's the point I'm about to make. People do it every day. And if you didn't wave at me, you're that person. People do it every day. People make dumb decisions and they risk it all for such a little reward. Samson didn't end up in a bad spot all at once. It was one step, one bad habit at a time. James 1, 21, it says this, it says, So get rid of every filthy uh, habit and all wicked conduct. Submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your heart, which is able to save you. Here's the thing. Starting a good habit is difficult. Start, starting a good habit is very difficult. And here's the reason why. Because when we try to step out and start a good habit, we don't see the progress and we don't see the results until months down the road, right? Come on, you, you, you want to work out. You, you want to get in the gym. You want to start running. Listen, I told y'all, listen, every morning right now, I'm running around the block every morning. I get out of bed. I take the block from under my bed. I run around it, and I get right back in bed. Listen, every morning I'm running around that block, but I got to start somewhere, you know? But we make these decisions and we say to ourselves, man, I I just want to get in shape. And I'm not talking about round. I'm talking about let's just get in shape. And we want to get up. We want to run. But we get up and maybe it's hot outside. Man, the humidity is thick. I could cut it with a knife right now. I mean, I'm sweating thinking about getting out of bed. And we want to get out of bed. We want to run. We want to do all of these things. We want to read our Bible. We want to go to church, but in our minds we're thinking, yeah, but gosh, man, it's going to take so much. I'm not going to see the results. I just, ah, there's so much more I can be doing. Do I have to go to church? Do I have to be here? And it's not until months down the road that we start to see a physique like myself, chiseled. (laughs) It's not until months later that you start to see 
that things are being restored, marriages are restored, uh, health is restored, depression is fleeing, oppression is fleeing. It's not until some time later that we begin to actually see the results of stepping into a good habit. So good habits are hard to start and usually have a payoff that is down the road. But here's the opposite for bad habits. The thing about bad habits is its immediate perceived benefits. And it's the negative results later. Bad habits. Sin is immediate perceived benefits. Negative for later. Listen, sin is fun. I'm just going to tell you right now, sin is fun. And if you don't think it's fun, you ain't doing it right. That's just straight up. If you don't think it's fun, you're lying to yourself. Sin is fun for a moment. But here's the thing about sin. Sin never reveals the end result. Sin never reveals the negative conduct. It never reveals the negativity down the road. What sin says is, hey, woo! I'm telling you right now, this is the best party I've ever been to. I'm feeling good. Like I should. Sin is fun. For a moment. I've never seen anyone that is in full, full swing of sin. In the moment saying this is horrible. I've never seen, even myself, I've never seen someone that is in the moment saying that this is crazy. I can't believe I'm doing this. Why? Because your endorphins are firing on all cylinders. Man, my, my adrenaline is kicking in. It is rushing. It is going full steam ahead. Sin in the moment is great, but it's not until moments later, weeks later, months later, that the negativity comes back around. Why? Because bad habits always feel good in the moment, and we don't see the negative results until later on down the road. You know, we get stressed out and think to ourselves, man, I just, just need a little cigarette. You know, just give me, give me a cigarette. Give me some, give me some alcohol. Give me, give me something to, to, to de-stress. I, I want a little, little cigarette. I want some alcohol. I want something to help calm my nerves. But it's not until years later that you go to the doctor and realize that you have cancer or you have liver disease. You know, we go... And we watch things and we read things and we tune into the news and we tune into, you know, Fox News, CNN News, you know, choose your news, whoever. We watch YouTube news. We're reading all this stuff on social media. We're always tuning in to negativity, 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 negativity. And man, the world is ending and, you know, political this and political that. And it's always negative. And then we find out, we come around the corner and we're talking to people and everything that we say is negative. Everything that we hear is negative. We're lashing out on people. We're hating on people. Why? Because we view them in a negative context. But it's because we're feeding ourselves with negativity. We, <clears throat> no one becomes something overnight. It always starts with one step, one day at a time. So how do we break bad habits? How do we break bad habits? And here's the first thing, if you're taking notes, the first thing that you have to do is you have to acknowledge it. How do we break bad habits? You have to acknowledge it. You cannot defeat what you cannot define. You have to acknowledge the habit. You have to acknowledge the bad in your life. Why? Because you can't defeat what you can't define. Listen, you know, if you've been coming here long enough, a lot of you know my story, but, you know, I, I remember going through life thinking to myself, you know, I got it all figured out. Nobody could tell me anything. Nobody could show me anything different. Nobody could put me on the right path. Listen, I heard time and time and time again, Charles, man, you're screwing up. Charles, you better, you better do something different. Charles, this is going to end up bad. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know what, I don't need this. Why? Because I got it all figured out. You can't tell me anything different. Why? Because I had it all figured out. 
I didn't acknowledge the problem. But it wasn't until I started seeing all my friends overdosing on drugs, going to their funerals. It wasn't until I started seeing all my friends end up in jail for five, ten, some of them in prison for life. It wasn't until I started seeing all of these things around me that I started to realize and acknowledge, you know what, maybe I do have a problem. Maybe I have a problem. Maybe it's not my friends that are forcing me to do this. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I am the problem, and it wasn't until I was facing 17 years in prison that I realized and I had to acknowledge, Charles, you're the problem. And I was going through all of these things, going through all of this stuff. and It wasn't until that moment that I had to turn from looking outward at everybody else as the problem. No, you're the problem. Playing the victim card. No, no, you're the issue. Until I had to face myself in the mirror and look at myself and say, you know what, no, Charles, you're the issue, you're the problem, and until you fix it, it's not going to change. I had to acknowledge the problem. Listen, some of you in here may not have a substance problem, but maybe some of you in here have a critical spirit. Maybe some of you in here have a complaining heart. Maybe some of you in here have a gossip problem. Well, Pastor Charles, you know, I just got to tell everybody their problem because I got to let them know how to pray for them. Come on. Maybe it's a gossip problem. Maybe it's overeating. Maybe it's sweets, it's snacks, it's fast food. Listen, maybe it's a digital problem. You're always playing uh, so you're always playing video games. You're on, you're on social media constantly just scroll, 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 scroll. Hours later, you're like, man, where did my life go? Come on, binge watching Netflix, Hulu, social media, or uh, Disney Plus, well, Amazon, whatever it is. You just binge watch. Listen, I, I'm going to confess right now I'm a binge watcher, so I ain't hating on you. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I, I love to binge watch. Me and Mariah, boy, we'll sit on the, boy, I'm, I'm going trip on this. Uh, you know, we'll sit on the couch forever. And we'll watch a show. Three, four hours go by. I'm like, I hate my life. What did we do? Did we kiss, make out, anything, anything fun in that? No, none of it. Got turned down. Skirt, watching the show. <laughs> hey. Listen, maybe some of us in here, it is a substance problem. Maybe it's sugar. It's nicotine. Maybe it's prescription drugs, alcohol. Here's the thing, if one more person that loves you says that you have a problem, maybe you have a problem. If there's people in your life that love you and that are always speaking life over you and they say, you know what, maybe you have a problem. Listen, acknowledge that you might have a problem. Until you acknowledge the issue, it will never change. So you have to acknowledge that there's a problem. How do we break a habit? The first thing is you have to acknowledge. The second thing is that you have to make it difficult to do. Make it difficult to do. Last week, it was the opposite. If you want to start a good habit, you have to make it easy, right? If you want to break a bad habit, you got to make it difficult. It's no secret in here that I love Oreos. I love them. I think Oreos are the cookie of heaven. I think that whenever I get to heaven, I'm going to get there, and Jesus is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Your reward is an Oreo fountain. That would be horrible, but great. But here's the thing. It is. It's true. Think about it. Oreos come in, in, in sleeves of three. It's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It is reality. It's truth. I love Oreos. I will sit up at night and I will binge watch Netflix. And I will eat Oreos with milk. I will eat a sleeve of Oreos and not even, it's like I just black out like, what happened? What happened? I don't even know what's going on. But I'll eat a sleeve of Oreos. So here's the problem. I'm trying to get healthier. I really am. I'm trying to get healthier. 
You know, Mariah and I haven't been eating out as much. We're cooking at home. We're trying to eat better. We're trying to get healthier. I'm 41. I want to be able to beat the snot out of my sons, you know, for the rest of their life. I'm, I'm trying to get healthy. So if I want to get healthy, I have to make it difficult to eat Oreos. I don't need them in the pantry. So if I want to make it difficult, I just, when I go grocery shopping, I'm shopping the perimeter. I'm not going down the cookie aisle. Why? Because I want a cookie. You have to make it harder and difficult to do. When you have a habit, you have to make it difficult to do. Proverbs 4 says this, Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Listen, I'm not saying that Oreos are wicked. I'm not saying that. But, but, but if you want to stop doing something, you have to stop walking on the road that you're walking in order to break the habit. You have to be able to do that. So there's five triggers. There's five little triggers that you have to be aware of. When you're trying to break a habit, there's five triggers you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of the place, the time, the mood, the moment, and the people. The place, the time, the mood, the moment, the people. You have to be aware of these triggers. Listen, if a trigger for you is a place, then you don't go to that place. If a trigger for you is an all-you-can-eat buffet, you don't go to Golden Corral. I'm just saying, like, listen, if you're trying to be healthy, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying not to clog the arteries, then you don't go to the Golden Corral. The Golden Corral, it's like the Facebook, the Instagram. I'm getting old. And so you don't go to Golden Corral. You avoid the place. If you have a problem with drinking, you don't go to the bar. If you have a problem with lust, you don't go to the club. You avoid the place. You avoid the time. If time is a trigger for you, where late at night you're lonely, you're bored, if time is a trigger for you, and that is the time where you begin to kind of look on things you shouldn't be looking at, then you need to ask a friend, a pastor, someone you trust to begin to help you with these things. Listen, at these times, I'm not good. So can you put locks on my phone? Can you take my, my, my computer? Tell your spouse. Mariah and I tell each other everything. Baby, I'm struggling with this. I'm having a hard time with this. I'm thinking about this. Listen, I may be a pastor, but I'm not perfect. So in order for me to protect myself, I have to let her know these are thoughts that I'm having. Please help me in this. I don't text females. If I, if I realize that I'm about to have a longer dialogue than, hey, what's going on? I don't ever text a female or email a female without Mariah being attached to it. Why? Because I don't want to put myself in a position where I am weak, I'm vulnerable, I am in this state of mind where I just am not thinking straight, and then all of a sudden I slip up. Why? I want to protect myself, so I'm putting my Raya, my Raya, I'm putting my wife on everything that I do. I, why? Because my time. I know, man, at late at night and when I'm, when I'm tired and I've been emotionally and spiritually pouring out all the time, my brain is not thinking all the time the correct way. So I have to be able to go to her. Mood. Man, listen, if you have bad mood all the time, figure that out. When I get tired, I get cranky. Straight up. I'm cranky. I'm irritable. I'm yelling at Charlie and Jackson and Mariah and... And Talon, I'm like, man, I can't stand all you people and you're driving me nuts. Listen, yesterday I was tired. I was in a mood. Mariah sent me to my room like a child and said, go take a nap. That's a fact. She said, you need to go in the other room and go to sleep. Yes, ma'am. It's my mood. Moments. 
if you have a bad moment, listen, how many of y'all know that when you argue with your spouse, sometimes you want to pick up the phone and call your girlfriends <clears throat> or your guy friends and just blast each other? And I can't believe what he did to me. It's just the rudest thing I've ever seen. He's a jerk. We, we have these moments. we got to protect these moments. Here, here's, the, here's the last thing. This is the most important. People. If you know people are a trigger, you have to protect yourself from people. You know, studies show, and really this is a fact, that the closer you are to someone, you're more likely you are to inhabit their habits. The closer you are to that person, the more likely you are to start acting like that person. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that, realized that? Like, I might be in a new group of friends, and, man, this is a new flow, a new, a new group of people, and, 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 and you never cussed before. You're not a cusser. But all of a sudden, man, you're dropping, you know, bombs all over the place, and you're like, what, what just happened to me? Like, I, I don't even know that I knew that word. Like, what, what's, what's going on here? Do you know what I'm talking about? You just pick up their grammar. You pick up their habits. You pick up their motion. People are very, very, very important to know who and who I cannot be around. My mom used to tell me all the time, Charles, you are who you hang with. Like, Mama, no, I'm not. I'm Charles. Like, back off, you know. Sure enough, when I acknowledged I'm the problem, and I acknowledged the crowd that I was in, guess what the problem was? It was me around them. You have to acknowledge the people. Listen, Proverbs 13 says this. I love this scripture. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a compassion of fools suffer harm. Let that sink in. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a compassion of fools suffer harm. I love that my friends, my closest friends, man, they're close to God. I love that about my friends. I can say that now. I couldn't then. I can honestly say that my friends, man, they love God. They love the church. Man, they love their wives. They have healthy marriages. They're working out. Hadn't got there yet. But they're working out. I, I can say that my friends, man, are doing great things. And so because they are my surroundings, it's easier for me to make those decisions. It's easier for me to not go to the bars and get smashed. It's easier for me to be faithful to my wife. Could you imagine if I hung out with the same group of friends that I used to hang out with? Smoking dope, you know, doing all these drugs, doing all of this stuff, man. Could you imagine what that would be like, me and Mariah having a bad day, we're not doing so good, and man, I'm just going out with the boys. It's midnight. I got a family at home. I'm just going out with the boys. It's so much easier for me to be faithful. It's so much easier for me to live a godly life because of the surroundings that I have. But Pastor Charles, I'm just trying to be a witness. You know, I'm just trying to be a good Christian. I'm trying to be a witness to these people. You know, can't, can't a Christian just go to the bars? Charles, can't a, can't a Christian just, can I be a good example for these people? Yeah, you can. I'm not saying it's a sin to go to the bar. I'm not saying it's a sin to go to the club. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when you put yourself in a dangerous environment, you're going to end up that environment. Listen, if you have a problem with this, this is a habit of yours, I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah, you don't need to go to a bar. You don't need to be around those friends. You don't need to try to be a witness. Why? Because you may be strong one night. You may be strong two nights. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten nights. You ain't going to make it. I'm telling you that from experience. It is a fact. You will fail at some point. It's not if. It's when. So you have to acknowledge that this is my problem. This is my habit. This is my trigger. So you run as far away from that trigger as you possibly can. And then maybe one day, maybe one day, yeah. 
But just like Samson, it said, one day, 56,250 steps later, he locked eyes with a lady named Delilah. And everything that he had been given, he lost. One day, one step, one habit at a time. You don't, you, if you don't control the environment, the environment's going to control you. 1 Corinthians 15, it says this. It says, do not, be, uh, do not be misled that bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. This is not something that I'm saying to you. This is something that the Bible is saying to you. And if you believe what the Bible says then you believe what the Bible says. So what do we need to do? We need to remove the triggers, and we need to interrupt the action. Remove the triggers and interrupt the action. If you have a hard time getting up in the morning and you're hitting the snooze clock four, five, six times, freaking take the alarm clock and put it in the kitchen. It's easy to get out of, or hard to get out of bed, but if you have to go and shut that thing off in the kitchen, well, I'm up. Might as well stay up. Put it in, put it in the kitchen. If you're overspending on Amazon, <clears throat> give your friends the password. Create a password to where you have to ask them, hey, what's my password? My husband is not letting me spend on Amazon. What's the password? <laughs> if you're looking at inappropriate things on your phone late at night, lock the thing. Delete social media. Get rid of Safari. Just do whatever you can do. Listen, your soul is more important than an image. Your soul is more important than an image. And that image will take you down a trail that when you wake up one day, you're going to find yourself, how did I end up here? How did I end up here? And I want to say this. Some of us in this room may have uh, severe issues. You might be in this room and you have a drug problem, an alcohol problem. You may be in this room and you have a gambling problem. You may be in this room and you have a sexual problem. I want to encourage you. If, if you're in this room and that is something very hard for you, well, Charles, man, listen, I make it difficult to go to these places. I make it hard, but I always find myself going there. Maybe you're in this room and maybe you actually need help. Maybe it's a little more than just putting things aside and putting your alarm clock. Maybe it is actually where you need rehab. You need help. Listen, I've been to them. I'm not telling you something that I haven't gone through. Maybe you need rehab. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way. And if you're in this room and you say, you know, Charles, man, I just, I need help, but I don't know how to go about getting it. Listen, see me after service. Let us help you. That is, that is our whole mission here is to help restore hope build futures. We are in Ocala. We were never looking in Ocala. We are in Ocala because I saw a guy hanging off the overpass trying to drop to commit suicide. And God laid on my heart, consider Ocala. We didn't know the first person here. And I thought to myself, this guy has lost all hope for life. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus loves you right where you are. He loves you in your seat. He loves you in your mess. Matter of fact, when you are weak, it's when he is strongest. But we have to understand, I cannot do this alone. And I want you to know, we will do anything and everything we possibly can to help you out. Don't stay that way. Why resist temptation tomorrow if you have the power to eliminate it? Don't resist temptation tomorrow when you can eliminate it today. Listen, if someone told me this earlier on in my life, I may not be or I may not have done what I did. 
But I want you to know, man, we are here to help and guide and direct and and do anything we possibly can to, to love you through it. Remove the trigger. Interrupt the action. Samson took 56,250 steps. But Samson also had 56,250 steps to turn around. And today, I don't know what step you're on today, but today is the day where you can remove the habit. You can stop walking in the direction. 56,250 steps. I believe that you may be on 3,250, whatever chance that is, whatever habit that is, but it is never too late to turn around and go back to Jesus. Amen? Come on, why don't we close our eyes. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in us and through us and in this room this morning. Father, I pray over every single heart and every single mind that you would guide them and direct them. Father, that you were with us, that you were guiding us. And Holy Spirit, I pray that every heart and every mind in this room, that you would search it, that you would bring to the forefront of their mind what it is that they need to deliver and give to you. And I'll never embarrass anybody, so if you're in this room, every head bowed, every eyes closed, and you just say, you know what, Pastor Charles, can you pray for me? Because there's habits in my life that I am ready to turn over to Jesus. I need to get rid of them. I need to let them go. I need to move on. Whatever step you're on, it's never too late to give to Jesus. And if you're in here today and you say, hey, can you pray for me because I'm ready to turn these habits over. If you can just slip up a hand, I just want to pray for you. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody repeat this after me. Say, dear Jesus. I thank you for today, for who you are, and for what you're doing in my life. I pray that this day, as I submit to you, and as you rescue me, come on, I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never. Come on, say never, never, never. Oh, it feels too good not to say it again. Say never, never, never. Be the same again in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen.